Enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to God and bless God's name, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness extends to all generations. Fitting words from Psalm 100 as we gather on this Thanksgiving Sunday. So welcome to you all, those gathered here and those who will be participating in the worship service online later today. Wherever we are worshiping today, we are together in spirit. Sisters and brothers in Christ, a community of the faithful, beloved children of our glorious God. I want to thank Marlene and Helen and uh, helpers for the beautiful decorations that were set up today. Um, just marvelous. Wonderful. Puts us in the Thanksgiving mood. And I want to thank, it's Thanksgiving, so I thought, I know in a couple of weeks we will probably give um, accolades to folks at the annual meeting, and I'll talk about that momentarily, but I think it's a good time to give Thanksgiving as, uh, because it's that day and because we have started public worship again, our first little step toward hopefully getting back to all of us together at the same time uh, here in the sanctuary. But I want to give thanks, uh, uh, first of all, to staff, uh, to Tara and to Amy, who uh, you know are really the ones that help get this worship going, to all of our volunteers, our greeters and our readers, our PowerPoint presenters, uh, Marion who does, uh, that makes the PowerPoint slides, and everyone behind the scenes um, to, to make worship happen. Uh, thank you so much. And for making me feel comfortable. <laughs> and of course, thanks to all of our worshipers uh, here and at home uh, for attending. Uh, it it uh, makes my heart glad, and I know it makes God's heart glad when you participate in worship, whether it's here or at home. So we have the protocols in place. I'm not going to go over them. Just please be sure to uh, maintain your distance as you get up. And uh, please, if at all possible, wear your mask at all times. Uh, if you are uncomfortable um, and you need to take it off, then please make sure you remain seated. And when you leave, make sure it goes back on. Eventually, we will get to see each other's lovely faces, but for now it's more important that we see healthy faces. Now I commend to you the reading of the announcements uh, there in your bulletin, but especially take note that we will be having our postponed annual general meeting following worship on October 25th. And that's a day in which we will be all able to be together because kindly St. Mary's and Good Church down the street, uh, East Saanich and Culpra, is it? Have, um, have, they've allowed us to have access to their church at 11 a.m. So we're going to worship there, physically distanced, and immediately following that service, we will have the annual general meeting. And, and so I'm announcing that, which is part of the protocols of the United Church, that there will be an annual meeting of the congregation on that date, at, at, after the service, of, which starts at 11. And in that service, some notes from Lissa, our chair, there will be some important things decided. First of all, there will be a vote on uh, the congregation becoming an affirming congregation, a vote on whether or not to join the organization. And often, uh, when a church congregation does become affirming, often has membership in Affirming uh, United, um, which is a national United Church organization. And there will also be a vote on the new four pillar plan. And uh, that isn't available to you today, but it will be next week for sure that you can pick it up. Um, or maybe, I'm not sure, it might be even emailed out to you, those of you who have emailed, but uh, those are the really important things that will be taking place, as well as uh, having the new slate of officers uh, approved. So that's the 25th, that's a couple of weeks from now. Anything else, Al, to mention about that? Is that good? All right, now, um, I also want to draw your attention to the Our Place Angel Gift Project. And so the staff at Our Place need to know for their own planning purposes and to, to connect up both the recipients and the donors 
They need to know at least the number of people who are pre uh, prepared to provide a gift, either a wrapped gift. Uh, yes, Ruth? No, I want to give a gift. Okay, all right. I'll try and remember that. So, so if you are uh, planning to um, provide a gift, an actual gift, or give cash to Pat Randazzo, who will make arrangements to buy a gift for you, she needs to know the numbers. Um, and I'm, I'm asking you to do that by next week, next Sunday. You don't have to have the gift by next week, just that she knows how many, so she can relay that to, uh, to our place and for their planning purposes. And this year, if you want to, it's always nice to give a personal message. It has to be placed inside your wrap gift. Um, and, and please just use your first name. Don't, don't identify yourself in any other way. All right, hopefully that's clear as mud. Any questions, just ask me or, or Pat. Um, so, at this point, are there any other announcements or, or celebrations to lift up? Birthdays, anniversaries, special occasions? Good news from not so good news. Thank you, thank you so much. Any other things to lift up with one another? Okay. Just one other announcement. Please remember for now to continue to register each week for the service, whether it's the early service or the 10 o'clock service. And also for the October 25th service, it's all to do with the contact tracing. We have the list ready and people can, uh, our greeters can tick them off. Uh, whether or not we have established a permanent list, that remains to be seen. But for now, if you would do that, uh, email or call in to Tara. And if it's after Thursday, you can be in touch with me. All right. I think we're, we're ready for worship. We light the Christ candle knowing that Christ's love shines like a beacon for those of us who are troubled, who are anxious, who are unsure, welcoming us, whatever our condition, into the presence of our God who loves us into wholeness of life. And our first hymn today is from Voices United 516. No singing, folks. God our maker does promise 
to God who created the earth and gives us the harvest. God provides all that we need. Praise be to God who surrounds us with love and strengthens us by the Holy Spirit. God's care never ends. People of God, let us give thanks. Praise be to God. Let us pray. As we gather and worship now, gracious and loving God, our hearts are filled with gratitude for our many blessings, the gifts of seeds and harvest, friendship and family, our homes and our freedoms. Encounter us now, generous God, we pray as we worship. By your Holy Spirit, move among us. To heal, to reconcile, to inspire and to empower us that we might live with open hearts and open hands to serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. And our next hymn of thanksgiving, We Plow the Fields.
And we welcome Helen Wright to read scripture for us this morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Your wisdom comes to us, O God, in word, in story, in life. As we listen to these readings from scripture and the world around us, may your spirit stir in us such that we receive deeper knowing and live ever more closely the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus tells a parable about God's invitation to the banquet of life in God's realm. The acceptance of such an invitation requires a faithful and grateful response of obedience to the ethics of that realm. We read from chapter 22 of the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told them several other stories to illustrate the kingdom. He said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. Many guests were invited, and when the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify everyone that it was time to come. But they all refused. So he sent other servants to tell them, The feast has been prepared, and choice meats have been cooked. Everything is ready. Hurry. But the guest he had invited ignored them and went about their business, one to his farm, another to his store. Others seized his messengers and treated them shamefully, <coughs> Excuse me, even killing some of them. Then the king became furious. He sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their city. As he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. <coughs> but when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? And the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind him hand and foot and throw him out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And now I have a reading from the world around us, an excerpt from a Thanksgiving reflection by Joseph Masomli. One day, many years ago, while strolling along a riverbank enjoying the soft grass beneath my bare feet and the warm sun pouring down unabashedly, I had this overwhelming impulse to be grateful. It was not a particularly unique experience, but an odd thought came to me that day. The odd thought was this. Perhaps the true primordial urge that prompts religion is not fear of dying, as Freud said, but appreciation for living. Just maybe there is a hardwired in humankind, a reflective yearning to give thanks, that we have some intrinsic psychic need to express gratitude, and that we ignore that yearning at great peril to our happiness and well-being. When primitive people rolled out of their caves each morning and looked about them at the high mountains and green valleys, they were awed by the beauty more than they were frightened by the dangers of the world. Maybe those primitives instinctively grunted a sound of thanksgiving for still being alive each morning, and maybe each evening, amazed they were still alive, they again gave thanks. Maybe the miracle of cool, fresh water and good hunting grounds made it impossible to just consume what seemed not merely there, but there for them to enjoy and nourish themselves. Maybe it seemed even to those uneducated, unrefined, barely human creatures that taking the earth for granted was churlish and unpardonably rude. Overcome with wonder more than fear, being thankful became part of everyday life. Gratitude remains the only key that unshackles us and lets us breathe free. Life is a peculiar phenomenon. We all unthinkingly use the phrase, the gift of life, but it's only a gift if we really think of it as such. 
If we don't, then life is an unbearable curse. It is hell itself. No matter how bountiful and varied our good fortune, life has no flavor and is devoid of any joy unless we are grateful for it. As a Dominican mystic, Meister Urquhart succinctly put it, if the only prayer you ever said in your life was thank you, that would suffice. For these words and insights, we give God thanks and praise. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Helen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. No matter how many times the little girl was told by her parents to do certain things, to put away her toys, not to leave the tricycle in the driveway or the teddy bear in the bird bath, it never got done. And one day in a fit of desperation, her mother said, why can you never remember what you were told? And the child replied, maybe it's because I have such a good forgetter. <laughs> the biblical record reveals that people of faith are often good forgetters. Remember the people of ancient Israel, they were good forgetters. Over and over again, they forgot what God had done for them and what God had told them to do. Over and over again, they forgot to keep their side of the covenant, that holy agreement of how God and the people were to relate to one another. They forgot that being recipients of God's grace, that being in relationship with God, meant to have certain responsibilities, to live in a certain way, to live in grateful response to God's blessings. And the parable that Helen read from Matthew tells us much the same thing. We are to remember that the invitation to the party brings joy, but also brings responsibilities. God invites us to the joy of living as kingdom of God people. But if we accept that gracious invitation, we have certain expectations put upon us. Set in the context of Jesus continuing critical conversations with the religious elite, that is the Pharisees and the chief priests, Jesus' parable is an indictment of the religious leaders who refuse the invitation to be part of the kingdom of justice and love that Jesus proclaimed. Such an invitation, if accepted, would mean having to give up their power and prestige. It would mean mixing with, even loving, those they considered undesirables and people of low social status. And so this is a parable that should hit home for us. In fact, it is aimed right at us. We who are religious, who state we are citizens of God's kingdom, but whose actions may at times indicate otherwise. It's a parable in which each of us might, if we dare, take stock of where we stand in relation to the invitation to be Christ's disciples, living out kingdom values and working to bring such values to bear upon the world. Within the Christian community, there are those like the folks in the parable who refuse the invitation from God for a variety of reasons. There are some who want the safe soft side of discipleship, shying away from the sometimes difficult work of outreach and justice. They are more than ready to enjoy God's good blessings, but they are reticent to engage in the work of ministry to which God calls them. They want peace on earth, a cleaner environment, help for the homeless, justice for all, but recoil from the challenging work and engaged commitment that these matters require. Now, I'm not meaning to point a finger at anyone, nor am I wanting to lay a guilt trip on anyone, but I am suggesting that we, myself included, of course, might hold this parable up as a kind of mirror to see where we are doing well and where we might be lacking in response to the invitation to join God and others in this banquet of the kingdom of life. During the time I served as community minister in Winnipeg, 
Every year on Christmas Day, we share a party of sorts, a wonderful meal arranged by our friends from Sherry Zedek Synagogue, complete with gifts supplied by the synagogue and area churches. There were gifts for every woman, man, and child who accepted the invitation. One Christmas, a woman, I'll call her Maggie, attended the party, and throughout the afternoon, she helped herself to as many articles of clothing as she could manage to hold. Even though she was repeatedly told that the limit was two in terms of taking those items of clothes, otherwise not everyone would get one. And she lied to the volunteers who served the meals, telling them, oh, I haven't got a meal yet. Although she had, and eventually she had three meals, which might mean someone else would do without. And at the end of the party, I noticed Maggie heading hurriedly toward the exit door, her arms full of gifts that she had received. I also noticed that her winter coat was looking strangely bulky, so much so that she couldn't quite zipper it all the way up. And underneath, I spied another winter coat, which turned out to belong to one of our volunteers. Maggie was attempting to steal it. Wearing two coats, one stolen, she was, in keeping with Jesus' parable, inappropriately dressed for the party. She had been invited to this Christmas party within a community with which she was familiar, which included her friends and neighbors, and through which, over the years, she had received blessing after blessing. She didn't realize, or rather she didn't care, that her relationship with God and with all the others who were at the party meant certain responsibilities. Later on, at a more appropriate time, I confronted Maggie about her behavior and let her know that if it continued, she would no longer be welcome to be part of that community. Not quite binding her hand and foot and throwing her out into the outer darkness, as in Jesus' parable, but you get the idea. Jesus' parable juxtaposes the grace of God, whose invitation to share in the joy of God's covenant community is extended to all, with the obligations of all in accepting that invitation. Invitation is at the heart of this parable, the invitation to a joyous feast. It is a joy that we are invited, and it is a joy that we miss if we refuse or abuse the invitation. Indeed, there is, as I know all of you have experienced, a great and profound joy in living and serving in the way of God. God's grace is freely given to us, and by way of gratitude, we are to live as God's people, upholding kingdom values and striving hard to bring those values to bear in our homes, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and even in far-flung places. This is our loving response, which we bring to God. On this Thanksgiving weekend, we are reminded that true thanksgiving, real gratitude, means responding to God's grace with lives lived according to God's will. It means being properly dressed for the party. As Paul declared in his letter to the Colossians, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Big Jim was at the same Christmas Day party as the aforementioned Maggie. Jim was homeless more often than not. He was an alcoholic who couldn't or wouldn't get help for his addiction. He came to the party wearing old, torn, ragged clothing adorned with many ugly stains. When the time came for the traditional door prizes to be given out, Jim's door prize ticket number was called out and his door prize was a brand new baby doll. Big Jim got up to receive his gift. One could hear laughter and even a few rude comments. Meant to be funny, all intended to embarrass him. He came forward to receive his gift and said, thank you very much for the gift and for the lovely party. As he returned to his seat, he spied a little girl, head down, almost in tears. Clearly, she'd been hoping that her door prize 
would give her that doll. And without missing a beat, Jim walked over to her table, bowed to her and her mother, and presented to her the baby doll. A few seconds of silence, and then everyone burst into applause. His clothing may have been old, ragged, and stained, but as it turned out, he was dressed just right for the party. In Jesus' parable, those gathered in from the streets had no reason to be at the party. They had no claim upon the king, nor the king's graciousness. They did not expect to receive an invitation to the party. It's grace. It's grace that extends the invitation to all of us. And grace, unsolicited, unmerited, an amazing grace that gathers us in. And the parable also tells us that grace is not just a gift, it is also a responsibility. The invitation goes out to all, but those who respond must be prepared to live a life which seeks to fit the love which called them. The parable is not about the clothes we wear to cover the body, but how we dress the spirit. Are we dressed properly for the party? God takes the dress code very seriously. Have we clothed ourselves in things like justice, kindness, and humility? How well do we fit into the kingdom of God if we don't care about justice for all people? How well do we fit into the kingdom if we care more about ourselves than our neighbors? How well do we fit into the kingdom if we are judgmental of others, if we are not welcoming and inclusive of others? True thanksgiving is living faithful lives and keeping with the will of God, the way of Christ. So with giddy gladness, let us accept God's invitation to the party. Let us fully immerse ourselves in the ongoing celebration within God's kingdom. And let us make sure that we outfit ourselves in the right clothes, in heartfelt gratitude for all the goodness of God showered upon us. Thanks and praise be to God. Amen.